psychology has gone through what the psychologists like to describe as a replication crisis, which is their discovery mostly by social psychologists who dreadfully deserved their replication crisis that, you know, at least 50% of what's published is simply not true. Now, that never shocked me because I presume fundamentally that if 5% of what we publish was actually true and original, we'd be, that's a 5% improvement in knowledge, in, in the total knowledge base on the research side per year. That's a stellar accomplishment, but it, it does mean that 95% of it's chaff and not wheat. And that's a very, very hard distinction to draw. And you can't just read the research literature and think that because it's published, it's true, because it's not true. And that's not surprising, right? Because it's actually hard to discover something new. But I was struck by the fact that that, you know, because the lay public, and this is partly why I'm pursuing this line of questioning, the lay public don't know how to distinguish between physician and scientist. Mm -hmm. And physicians also don't know that and presume that they're scientists. But generally speaking, well, most scientists aren't scientists and damn few physicians are. And partly it's a consequence of not being able to, not being taught to think critically. Now you learned that in law school and you enjoyed that, right? And yeah, and you enjoyed that in a way that you didn't enjoy medical school, is that fair? Yes, 100%. Huh. First of all, I didn't even understand the difference between physician and scientist, I will, I'm, but I'm validating that American medical schools do not teach critical reasoning skills and they do not teach us how to analyze science, for sure. That is and That's also a major problem major on the diagnostic problem. front because yes. part of being a good diagnostician really is thinking like a scientist. It's like, yeah. here's the presenting problem. Well, maybe, like, have we fleshed it out enough? What are the potential contributing factors, all of them? You know, if you go to diagnosis and then you have algorithmic treatment, well, that's fine if you got the diagnosis right, but getting the diagnosis right tends to be an extraordinarily difficult thing. The diagnosis is all of it, and I'll just digress a little bit here just because I, I share with you some of my training. So I had a very unusual circumstance because I went to my internship, which was my first year of residency, then I went to law school, then I went back to residency training. In that three or four years, something had changed in American medical training. and it, What years were these? This was um, around 1990. Yeah, okay. So what happened was, perhaps you've heard of the Libby Zion scandal. What had happened in America was a young girl had gone to the emergency department and she was very sick and she was sitting in this emergency department. She ends up dying. Turned out her father, I think, was a reporter for the New York Times, very well-connected person. And he decided that this happened because the medical residents were so tired and sleep deprived oh, and yes. overworked. Right. So in the years that I was away- And they often are. In the years that I was away, but I'm going to blow your mind a little bit yeah. because in the years I was away, they changed how resident physicians were trained. Up until that moment, so in my internship, in my first year, we routinely did 36-hour shifts. You yeah. start at 7 or 8 in the morning, you go to 7 or 8 the next night, you crash, you go to sleep, and then you'd have a couple more days of like 8 to 6 or 8 to 7, and then you come back every third or yeah. fourth day, do that. And there's no question that it's brutal. Yeah. A friend I, of mine drove off the road and broke her arm as a consequence of that. And Hawaii, a physician that I know, radiologist. And, yeah, no, yeah, for sure. There's some, there's something bordering on sadistic about that. But so. I'm going to show you a different side of it. Yeah, yeah. So because on the surface, and to policymakers, that sounds brutal. That sounds terrible. That sounds like it contributed to Libby Zion's death or caused her death, right? That's how it sounds to all the politicians. Okay, whoa. I did that my first year. Very hard went to law school, went back to residency, and the rules had changed. Mm -hmm. The rules had now said, no, no, residents have to get enough sleep. So the work schedule became uh, on every fourth day, you, the first day was like eight to six, the next day was maybe eight to 10 p.m., then the third night, uh, it, basically you worked during the day and you had a night float. So you could work eight or 10 hours, then a night float would come in. This is maybe how nurses worked, which is you have a shift work, graveyard shift maybe, and then cro cross over, but you didn't have responsibility throughout the whole cycle. So doctors became shift workers. Now, this is, was a terrible decision if you want the doctor to understand disease from the bedside. If we're not scientists, right? We can't mm -hmm. analyze the data, read the data, really understand it. Then our best hope of helping patients is to really understand the disease from the bedside, mm -hmm. right? To be with that patient for 36 hours. What happened when I went back to my residency with the change in work hours was resident physicians, young physicians, were no longer following a disease 
kind of from beginning to end for the progression. Mm-hmm. They were checking in 8 a.m., checking out at 6 p.m. The crisis would happen at 10 p.m. or midnight on the night float. The night float didn't care about the patient, didn't really know about the patient. You come back in again the next day, it became very sluggish. You didn't see the disease progression from beginning to end. A person would come in with congestive heart failure, and you there was never a situation anymore where you followed the disease to see its whole natural course. Right, right, right. This yeah, it's very unlike clinical psychology practice where that wouldn't necessarily be that wouldn't be necessary. It wouldn't be necessary, speaking. but for physicians, yeah, it's you not want, as much of a crisis. When you are seeing a mid career physician who's fifty years old, you want them to have gone through that full cycle of seeing the disease at some point in their career. The only way you can have that is if you're really in for uninterrupted. When they switched it to shift work, I saw firsthand the shift in how doctors interact with patients, treated patients. No longer did you feel such ownership over the patient. This was your patient. It was like kind of your patient for eight or 10 hours. Then it was somebody else's patient for eight or 10 hours. Then it was your patient again. So diffusion of responsibility. Diffusion of responsibility. Yeah, that's a... And that's you didn't follow generally the, a bad thing. And you didn't follow the disease the whole time. Mm-hmm. So in my first year, did that increase finger pointing? I think yes, but it was deeper than that. It was um, nobody was really in charge. Quite frankly, right, right, it was just right. a checkbox or a template that was in charge. Before uh-huh. that, if my patient crashed in the middle of the night, I was there, and I knew it. And so I became a better doctor through those exact experiences. That was gone once the work hours changed. And I don't think policymakers had any idea that there would be a downside, right? It sounds all positive to protect the yeah. work hours. That's I the think iron the law of unintended yes. consequences. I just right? wanted to share that. Right, yeah, yeah. 